So if you only have a little over one week, is it reasonable to think about taking a trip to New Zealand? I recently did just that, and it's easier than ever with more flights from the US, including a seasonal non-stop directly to the South Island, where you'll find many of the country's top attractions. In this nine-day itinerary, I'll share a road trip that'll take you to see glaciers, hike stunning lakes and rivers, and reveal experiences you won't have anywhere else in the world. Here's a quick overview of what to expect. Day one starts in Christchurch, and you'll head for the central lakes of the Southern Alps along your way to Queenstown. After having some adventures in the area, you'll spend two days exploring the Fjordlands National Park. From there, you'll head back north by way of Monica and the West Coast. This trip wraps up back in Christchurch after you've finished driving over Arthur's Pass. While you can expect to spend a few hours each day in the car, it's well worth it. Stick around to the end, I'll tell you where you can find large, multicolored, flightless birds that were once thought to be extinct for over 50 years. So with that said, let's get to it. Upon arriving in Christchurch, we rent a car. If you're not accustomed to driving on the left side of the road, it'll take a little bit of time to get used to. Fortunately, you won't encounter many stressful traffic situations on the many rural roads you'll drive on. Your first night should be in the small town overlooking Lake Tikapu. During the three-hour drive, you'll gradually see the flat terrain give way to rolling hills. Once in the town, take time to walk along the southern shore where you'll cross a bridge and find a beautiful chapel overlooking the lake. Day two starts early. You're just over an hour away from one of the best hikes in the country, the Hooker Trail. Along the way, you'll drive by Lake Pukaki, which is one of the most brilliant blue colors I've ever witnessed in my travels. Along the well-maintained Hooker Trail, trek over elevated boardwalks and suspension bridges that cross over the glacial water as it rushes by you and collects in a series of lakes. In the distance, you'll steadily watch the crown jewel of the Southern Alps, Mount Cook, gradually come into focus. At the end of the trail, you'll be rewarded with views of Hooker Lake, where you should be able to see ice floats. It's a fairly easy 6.8 mile in and back hike with a modest elevation gain. My advice is to do this hike first. It's very popular and going early will help with beating some of the crowds. After you've finished the Hooker Trail, just to the east is a worthwhile stop to climb up to view the Tasman Glacier, the largest in New Zealand, covering over 100 square kilometers. Unexpectedly, you'll find the viewable part of the glacier entirely covered in rocks, caused by runoff from the nearby mountains. Fortunately, this slows the rate of melting. For the next three hours, you're in for an incredibly scenic drive as you head down towards Queenstown. The variety of landscapes is incredible, none more seemingly out of place than the Omuraba Clay Cliffs. As you continue your drive, you'll see a gorge carved by the Kawaru River. If you're up for it, take some time to hike the Gibson River Trail. If you're a wine lover, this is where you'll find the central Otago wine region. In the immediate area, you'll find 20 wineries that feature Pinot Noirs and a number of other white wine varietals. Upon arriving in Queenstown, you'll find plenty of options for accommodations. If you stay close to downtown, you can park once and enjoy this very walkable city. Queenstown is nestled between a series of mountain ranges along Lake Wakatipu. This unique geography offers stunning views. I enjoyed walking along the waterfront and visiting the city gardens. I recommend spending a minimum of two nights in the area. In the town center, you'll find a number of great restaurants and plenty of nightlife. Just to the north, you can also visit the former mining town of Arrowtown. This scenic main street offers a number of great restaurants and shops that I highly suggest checking out. Queenstown lives up to its claim as the adventure capital of the world, and you should set aside day three to do something extreme. The most popular activities include bungee jumping, jet boating, and skydiving. I couldn't resist and signed up for end zone skydiving. They pick up right from downtown and take you to their airfield to the south. I recommend booking a time in the morning as the weather is often better and you'll be less impacted if there's a backup due to delays. I'd never skydived before, but it was hard to be nervous looking at those views. I was the first one out of the plane, and while it was terrifying, jumping out with a tandem diver makes it a lot easier. The 7,500 foot fall was intense, but there's no place I would have rather done it. 
If you're less adventurous, consider taking in the views from a gondola or going on a cruise aboard the TSS Ernslaw, the last steamboat in the Southern Hemisphere, dating back to 1912. Just 45 miles to the west of Queenstown is Milford Sound, arguably one of the most incredible fjords in the world and a must-see destination. While some choose to take a quick flight to visit, I recommend investing the extra time to do the drive, as there's a lot to see along the way. So much that I suggest staying two nights in Teanu. On your fourth day, you'll drive two hours from Queenstown and still have time for a cruise on the island's largest lake that shares the city's name. While cruising, to your immediate west, you'll find towering mountains, but your main attraction is below ground. Upon reaching the other side of the lake, you'll enter a cave system with a river running through it. When darkness falls all around you, you'll see the main attraction, glowworms. These creatures emit chemically produced blue-green light that they use to lure their prey. One thing to note is you are now in the fjordlands of New Zealand, and this will be likely the first place that you encounter the dreaded sandflies, especially in the summer months. To best prepare for these tiny, biting insects, I recommend wearing long-sleeved skirts that are light-colored and applying a DEET bug repellent to any exposed skin. I recommend dedicating your next day to Milford Sound. By starting your day in Tainu by 8 a.m., you should be able to get a two-hour jump on all the day trippers coming from Queenstown. This will really help with ensuring that you're able to get parking and not experience any lengthy delays as you go through the one-way tunnel. The drive itself is incredible and worth periodically stopping to take pictures. Upon arriving in Milford Sound, you'll find the port terminal with numerous tourist operators. I didn't find the tours to be very different from one operator to the other. I just chose an operator with one of the smaller boats. Expect the tour to run for about two hours. Even in the summer months, there's a reasonable chance that you'll have an overcast day, so manage your expectations. It wasn't until the end of my tour that the sun started to come out. It's also the wettest inhabited location in all of New Zealand, so you'll just have to make the most of when it rains. On the upside, you'll be treated to dozens more waterfalls than the two permanent ones. It's definitely worth it regardless of the weather. While you cruise between 4,000 foot cliff faces, you may also encounter whales, seals, or penguins. On the way back to Tanu, stop over to see Christie Falls, which is just along the side of the highway. Marion Falls is also just a quick drive off the main highway and an easy hike. Both of these beautiful waterfalls feature some of the clearest water I've ever seen. Another worthwhile stop is the Lake Gun Nature Walk. This flat loop takes you along beautiful blue water with inspiring views. If you can afford an extra day in the Fjordlands, I recommend an excursion to Doubtful Sound. Unlike Milford Sound, this is one of the most isolated places on the planet. Visiting takes a whole nine hours. Prepare to take a bus, to a boat, to a bus, and then to another boat, and then repeating the whole process over again. You'll cross Lake Manapouri first to the site of the largest hydroelectric power plant in the South Island of New Zealand. While impressive, you won't see much. It's actually all underground. From there, it's back on a shuttle bus to take you to Doubtful Sound, where you'll likely be the only boat on the water as you cruise to the Tasman Sea. The day of my tour was a constant downpour. Frankly, if the forecast is calling for rain, there's no better place to be. From the comfort of the ship, I was able to take in an eerie or even mystical environment featuring countless waterfalls. The water is also black, caused by all the runoff, where approximately six meters of fresh water sit on top of the salty ocean water. The unique environment blocks out the light, making it ideal for deep sea life to thrive in shallow waters. Upon returning from Doubtful Sound, I spent the late afternoon driving the three hours back north past Queenstown to Wanaka. This town features a walkable downtown area with many restaurants and hotels to choose from. The following morning, make your way along the shore of the lake to check out the famous tree that grows right out of the water, then grab a quick breakfast. Afterwards, embark across the mountains to the west coast. Along the way, you'll find a number of waterfalls to check out, if you're comfortable with wading through the river, you could also check out the blue pools. Unfortunately, when I visited, it wasn't safe to cross after an abundance of rain, as the bridge is no longer in service. Once you're along the coast, take some time to stroll along the beach at Ship Creek, 
where you can watch the whiskey-colored river blend with the waves of the Tasman Sea. While the sand flies are no joke on this beach, I didn't have any issues further up the road at Lake Matheson. This incredible lake features a beautiful loop trail that on a clear day offers views of Mount Cook reflecting in the calm waters. Before you finish the day, save enough daylight to complete the short walk up to the Franz Josef Glacier. While the glacier has significantly retreated, you can still make it out. If you're keen on a more up-close experience, the nearby town that shares its name offers frequent helicopter excursions. Franz Josef also features a Kiwi Wildlife Center, where you can see the bird that serves as the national symbol of New Zealand. There are also tours that you can take to find the flightless nocturnal bird out in the wild. For your last day on the road, you'll have a five-hour drive back to Christchurch over Arthur's Pass. Note that if you can afford to spend a full two weeks on the South Island, this is when I recommend continuing north to Nelson, where you'll find more wine, Abel Tasman National Park, and even the beach found on all the Windows log-on screens. While I couldn't make that happen, I did get a chance to hike around the incredible Hokitika Gorge before making it over the mountains. Beyond the mountains lies the Castle Hill Rocks, where you're able to climb amongst the boulders. Across the road, there's also a place to do a hike through a cave if you're prepared to do some wading and have a headlamp. For your last day, take some time to explore Christchurch. The second largest city in New Zealand has plenty to offer. It suffered a devastating earthquake in 2011 and in some respects is still recovering. But the downtown area offers a number of walkable streets and a number of great lunch options at the Riverside Market. I also recommend taking time to explore the Botanical Gardens and the lively new Regent Square area, where I found my best meal of the trip, the 27 Steps Restaurant. If you have extra time, drive out to Summer Beach. It's only 20 minutes away and it's worth the trip to dip your toes into the Pacific. Also consider taking the long way back through the tunnel in Littleton. Along the way, you'll find a number of stunning overlooks. As promised, let's talk about some unique birds. Few places in the world rival New Zealand's birds from the Kiwi to the Kia, the world's only alpine parrot. Some scientists argue Kias may be as smart as a four-year-old. It's not uncommon to see them flying off with small items or bothering tourists. The Teanu Bird Sanctuary is free to visit at any time, and this is where you'll find the Tekuhu, a large blue flightless bird that features red legs and beak. Basically, a giant colorful chicken. Once thought to be extinct, thanks to recovery efforts, it now has a population of around 500. While New Zealand is a pretty temperate place, I recommend visiting between October and March. It won't make much of a difference in terms of how much rain or cloud cover you see, but it will be a more comfortable temperature and the daylight hours are nearly twice as long in the summer as they are the winter, allowing you to cover more ground. While airfare will set you back over $1,000 a ticket, I found New Zealand to be more affordable than many destinations in the United States. I was able to find well-appointed hotels for $200 a night on average during peak season in desirable areas. Let me know in the comments if you've had a chance to visit the South Island of New Zealand and whether I've missed anything in this video. If you found this video to be helpful, please like and subscribe. While I'm sure this could be your next perfect trip, stay tuned to see what's next.